Hi everyone, thanks for stopping by. I'm Bob Polinski, Master of Wine. Today's video is packed with information on Portuguese wine. If you haven't explored much in Portugal, you're missing out on some of the most interesting wines in the world that also happen to be some of the very best values. I recently was in Portugal where I was a judge at the Wines of Portugal Challenge. This is one of the major wine competitions held there. Also spent some time out in the wine country. I was traveling with about 20 wine professionals from various places around the world. Along the way, I had one of the top winery visits of my entire life. I'm going to share some of that story. And then the back part of the video is going to be more about some of the food and wine experience there. I'm also going to provide the producer names that you should absolutely search out. And I broke it out in terms of more of an opening price point, mid and premium price point. And then the very end of the video, I'm going to reveal the top award winners from the competition itself. Over the years, I've judged in wine competitions all around the world. The standard is applied to each of these can vary greatly. Some of them are simply marketing machines. In this case, this is a very legitimate competition. Less than 10% of the entries win gold medals. That's a very low number. Most of the judges are from the Portuguese wine trade. There's a high percentage of winemakers. The international judges included a good number of psalms, some writers, and people connected to the Portuguese wine trade in various ways. The range of style is very broad, perhaps broader than anything else you can experience anywhere in the world, partly because of the high number of indigenous grape varieties. The average quality was very good, and oftentimes the pricing is extremely affordable. So what is it that you can expect from Portuguese wines? I attended several days of master classes. There was plenty of talk of wine regions, grape varieties, winemaking techniques, and so on. But a major point of difference from the rest of the world is the strong presence of indigenous grape varieties. Over 97% of what's produced in Portugal is from indigenous grape varieties. The so-called international varieties are just a bit player. Every region in Portugal produces wine of varying degrees. Places like Douro and Dao get a lot of attention but the reach goes well beyond that. Aside from the vast range of grape varieties, the terrain also varies greatly, where there's long stretches of coastal maritime influence regions and also some mountainous continental inland regions. For anyone searching out new and interesting wines to explore, Portugal should be at the top of your short list. After three days, it was off to one of Portugal's lesser known wine regions. At this point, the group headed out on a four-hour bus journey on lightly traveled rural roads until arriving in the Beira Interior. It's one of the few places in Portugal that has snow-covered peaks in the wintertime. The region is split into three sub-regions. The further north one goes, the higher the altitude. This is the source for the most interesting wines. As is the case in much of Portugal, the range of grape varieties is very broad. But in this particular area, for the reds, the primary focus is Torriga Nacional, Tinta Royes, and Torriga Franca. Also had some very interesting bottles of Ruffet, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that a bit later. Most of the reds have good concentration, good weight, and in many cases they are not overly oaked. With the whites, they tend to be crisp, fresh, bright. Again, not a heavy oak influence in many cases, really a very modern style of wine production. Primary grape varieties are Syria, Fontcal, also had a very interesting and appealing bottle of Goveo. Beira Rinks is one of my all-time favorite winery visits. Uber quality minded, high altitude vineyards, old vines, very low yield, no irrigation, indigenous grape variety, native yeast, judicious amounts of oak, wines with a true artisanal presence. If you can find these, definitely pick them up. I visited hundreds of wineries and they all start to look the same, but this one stood out. Sure, this one has the commonly found modern winemaking equipment, but I like the way the wines are not made by formula. They reflect the vintage, a vineyard, and a grape variety. There's also a good deal of experimentation and the wines are not over manipulated. Here, concrete vats are used with some wines. It's an old method that's made a comeback in many places around the world. And concrete egg-shaped tanks have become increasingly common all around the world. It was finally time to taste through the wines. For me, this Goveo was a standout. Tangy acidity, lemon zest, and anise seed no to it. Fantastic balance. Absolutely love this wine. 
This was another beauty. The Fa Kal is outstanding. It's weighty, rich, ripe. There's good length to it. This is seriously well-made wine. Here's something super cool and well worth searching out, Ruffet. This is a pale red. It's fresh, bright, clean. There's good acidity. There's a slight bitterness on the back palate. With a slight chill, this is the perfect summertime wine. And finally, the last wine tasted was the Tinta Reyes, what is commonly called Tempranillo in Spain. This wine was deeper, denser, fuller, more concentrated, certainly built to age for a bit. All things considered, this was a beautiful range of wines. Time for a quick vineyard visit. As is the case with most top-notch wines, it's all about the vineyards. There's a 145-year-old windswept vineyard, one of the oldest vineyards that I've ever visited. It's planted to a field blend, which was a common practice many years ago. The harvest yield from these old vineyards is very low. In this case, it's under two tons of fruit per acre. The vines are knotted and twisted, weathered by a century plus of time. It's like walking through a living museum. This vineyard visit occurred in early May as the new grape clusters were just developing. At this point, it's back on the boss, ready for the next winery visit. I thought about dozing, but I couldn't get enough of the dramatic landscape. The terrain here is rolling, vegetation is scrubby, the wind is constant. It's the ideal environment for low-yield wine production. This is one of the key factors for elevated wine quality. Combine that with the indigenous grape varieties and the non-intrusive winemaking process, you're set up for a very good end result. The panoramic views kept coming around nearly each twist and turn of the road until we arrived at Quinta Ducardo. After a quick glass of sparkling, it was time to jump into a two meter deep ditch. Yep, you heard that right. This was dug into the vineyard and what this was intended to show was how deep the roots actually go in the vineyard. This is a very dry place. There's no irrigation. And the vine roots must go very deep to get the water and nutrients that they need to survive. The afternoon was all about regional foods and regional wines eaten out in the vineyard. It's funny how this group of 20 people suddenly became much larger. We are making a uh, key goat like if it was a suckling pig. So it's, there is all, only one village in Portugal that still does this uh, dish. And uh, there is two chefs and one of them gentleman that is here that uh, has been working on the oven so we have an old oven uh, on this stone house that we recovered yesterday so, <laughs> so just for you just for you so you're going to taste uh, one of the greatest thing about portugal that is uh, that is for me uh, that is this difference of uh, going to some village and have different food that doesn't exist anywhere and i think portugal is a little bit of this it's a small country and any region you have different things and this is one of them so i hope you enjoy and uh, cheer the very young kid goats were roasted for several hours in stone ovens the end result was a tender dish with a crispy savory skin Enjoying it with local wines was certainly a memorable experience, but I think it's safe to say I will not be attempting to do this from home. And a quick check of the vineyard floor before heading out. Notice that it's not billiard table clean. This is a sign the ground has not been overworked and there have been no heavy chemical additions used in the vineyard. In the Beira interior, the microclimate is very interesting. The weather can change quickly. A clear, beautiful day can suddenly turn into a wet, rainy one. This is the hinterlands of Portugal. On our way back to the home base, we encountered a roadblock. And for a brief moment, I thought this could be payback time for the lunch that we had just enjoyed. As for the foods, I won't go too deep into it, other than saying the foods and wines certainly do mirror each other. Both have an expressive, intensely rustic appeal. They're well-made, very uncomplicated manner from local ingredients. This was even true for the Michelin star restaurant. This eye chart captures my final results from the competition, but my recommendations to you are going well beyond the competition itself. What I'm suggesting to you are sources that bring excellent quality for the money. Some of these have very good international distribution, others are a bit more hit and miss. If you can't find the specific producers that I'm mentioning, at the very least, I suggest that you search out some of the Portuguese grape varieties that have been discussed here.
Two sources that offer a broad range of Portuguese wines, oftentimes at the lower price range, is Casa Santos Lima and So Great. In general terms, these both have good international distribution. A couple of other producers to search out is Quinta de Crasto. Uh, this is from the Douro. They have a wide range of wines, many that fall in that mid-price range. Also, the previously mentioned Beira is also well worth searching out. Postscriptum is another excellent value, getting quite good international distribution. I'm talking about the wine, not the video game. This one brilliantly captures what modern-day Dura wine is all about. Another that falls into a more of a premium price point, which is going to be quite difficult to find, is one called Quinta dos Termos. Had a fantastic experience there, absolutely love their wines, the entire range, very, very solid, but with limited distribution. And finally, here are the award winners from the wine competition. Faz parte da equipa da Flipa. Flipa tem a responsabilidade dos Estados Unidos e Canadá. Was the organizer of the competition, and Kinema Conference Center in Santarém was our host for the uh, from the 8th through the 10th of May. During the last few days, we've tasted 1,380 wines from 347 different producers from 13 different regions. That's a lot of wine. This year, the competition was executed by 139 judges. 21 of them came from abroad. And as often the case, after a week of wine, it's time for some cold beers. Today's video covered a lot of ground. Thank you so much for staying to the end of it. If you haven't subscribed, consider doing so as it very much does help this channel. Hit that like button. If you comment down below, I will do my very best to follow up. I'm drinking a Tariga Nacional Castellau blend. I think I'm going to be drinking okay today. I hope you are too. And until next time, cheers.